Hi, my name is Cameron Asensen. I wrote the Microbiome Prescription Side. We've been up for almost three years now. We have had two over 2,000 samples uploaded. Um, the three main labs that had the most uploads are Fry, Ubiome, which is a classic, and Biome Side, which is a UK firm. We have also a bunch of other ones. The one, the ones which I'm most impressed about is a, is a Spanish company called Genogen but there's only be a handful of people from there. What I want to do, because somebody asked me to do it, is to do a walkthrough of how to do analysis on the site with the latest revisions. The site is always evolving, improving. Data is recomputed on a daily basis, which means from day to day you will see site changes. Um, you also, the data for um, Suggestions is also changing usually at least once a month, sometimes every couple of weeks. Right now, I'm running a background job to start the manual review of studies which appear to be relevant, and it gives me a short lesson. And I go in and read articles and extract any data and then quote it into the database. So let's take it from the top. We first we log on. We have a 16S sample, one or more. We go there, we have, here in this case, we have several samples there. This person actually was doing back in 2017, so four years of samples. We, what we're going to do is we are going to look at the latest samples, and that is 321, I believe is the date, yep. Uh, we have actually two samples, both for the same stool. One done by Cosmos ID and one done by Cry. I won't go into comparison in this particular thing. That's worthy of a separate video. So the, the question, first question is, what do you want to do with, with your results? And there are these three or four different paths to go. One is you don't have any dominate, dominating medical issues. You just want to improve it. Or you have, it's sort of vague, etc. So there. Two, you have a bunch of symptoms or one or more symptoms which you are concerned about and you really like to improve that. Um, the adage, no man can serve two masters, should be remembered. If you're trying to do a fix for two symptoms, you may not get as good as results for either symptoms than if you concentrate on one. So keep that in mind. Single symptom focus usually produce the biggest bang for or the biggest result in terms of symptoms or you could have a specific medical conditions you're wanting to work with or you're about to be take a prescription drug which you're not crazy about and you want to know how to compensate for it there's a dozen reasons which you could do it and almost all the choices are sitting there on the site to help you make those decisions but that also means there are a ton of choices which gets confusing. So uh, let's start at the simplest one. We're going to take a look at Thrive here. Um, and if you click change your microbiome, it goes and gives you a bunch of suggestions. And the suggestions, which is the most interest for us, uh, I'll just scroll down so you can see all of them, is um, the suggest a um, Natural path in New Zealand has, oh, sorry, correction, Tasmania, um, has general guidance for what you'd like to see a microbiome for. And generally, this is the microbiome of a Western person with Western style diet. Um, Jason, I've met and talked to, and we've corresponded with, and he's a good head. Where, whether or not his suggestions work always, I've heard good and bad results from people following his advice. Um, and that's not surprising. The microbiome is complex. I don't promise results. All I try to do is determine the substances which have the highest probability of giving the desired result. It's basically a probability game. You could draw a short straw, or you could draw a very um, long straw as you try things. So. Let's go in and first let's take a look at his suggestion. So all you do is you click that. Everything is automated. You now see suggestions, uh, things you should take and things you should avoid or reduce. 
frequently it can be a bit of surprise to people. Um, so let's check it at the top. N name is the, the sample you're coming from. We have no filter. We're using ranges from JSON. So everything is, is kind of predetermined. Um, bacteria details. Here are the bacteria. According to his ranges, you are too high or too low end. And those are the things which we are going to attempt to modify down below. And you notice the highest number is one. The actual number that are calculated can in some cases be four or five hundred or even thousands. Other cases could be 0 0.08. All of it is trying to build off the confidence interval. And then we simply get all these raw numbers and then we scale it. So the highest number becomes a one and then everything is relative to a one. And the main advantage is um, people are less prone to misinterpret the numbers because all it is is relative confidence. So inulin is the one which is top of the list. It has the highest confidence. Soy, burdock root, um, et cetera, it's a bunch of things sitting there. Um, and the number goes down. Over here are the other side. Notice we have 0.336 being the first one to avoid. Usually you want to do the same stop point for there. So basically the main thing to avoid would be a high fat diet. Aspirin is something you may want to, you want to remove. And then we go down a variety of things. Now all some all the stuff may be very familiar to you or may not be familiar with you. In general, what I've done is I've tried um hyperlinking everything. Like for example, here is something which is probably not familiar to too many people. So I just go to click that, open up in a new window. And we now get information about which bacteria it impacts. And as you can see, it impacts a thousand different bacteria. In some cases it increases, some cases it decreases it. So most of the names you will find if you go to uh, amazon.com, you'll find it it's probably available as a supplement. Um, you don't need to take all of this. All of these are items individually having good probability. Some of them may have the same impact as something else, um, which you, you do. So my general suggestion is look for things which are on the list, which you can get relatively cheaply, because that way the risk to your pocketbook is minimal. Don't try doing doing all of it. In fact. Generally add in one thing at a time for a week, see if it makes a change. If things improve, add another thing from the list. If there's no change, then it's up to you. If it's a deterioration, take stop immediately and take it off the list. Um, so we have a variety of things there. Reservatol, pomegranate, um, one particular probiotic shows up high on the list. Now down below we have something which people have asked for time and gain is okay i give you your name but i walk in the store and that's a lot of reading of fine print etc well i do have about 200 different commercial retail probiotics contents on my site and i use that to apply what the suggestions are and there we have a particular type of probiotics which have a positive impact and in this case a positive impact means something very special. It means that in terms of all the studies I've been able to locate, none of them changes any of the bacteria we have here in the wrong direction. For example, if this is too low, it could increase it to be higher. If it's too high, it could take it to be lower. So the positive impacts are the ones where there's absolutely no evidence that it will do anything other than help. Um, again, the number here is didn't scale out of one, but it's sort of the relative impact, so you can really see what the impact is. Um, sometimes the number can be pretty high, and it is a combination of how many bacteria it impacts, how many studies indicate it has a specific impact, and how much change you're trying to shift the bacteria. So there's a bunch of factors all computed in and we get a magic number out. Um, so we have two things. Uh, for example, pendulum glucose control is nice, but it's about 90 bucks a bottle. Ouch. 
whereas custom probiotics um, per cancer is 367, which is half the impact, although you will get a bottle for about a 50 to 60 dollars, the amount of probiotic in it will last you three or four or five months with no problem and it's high concentration with absolutely no additives to it which is how i prefer by probiotic often you will get a case where inulin is not something to be taken or some other prebiotic is something not to take and if you just take something off the shelf it probably has it there's own custom probiotic as well these these companies who only sells the pure probiotic strains which we tested and its specific species and we have the research on it so it's sort of okay it is a safe conservative and also generally costs a lot less per billion community of uh, forming units or CFUs than most commercial probiotics so you it's a freeway win um, and then we have other things. For example, here we have a something which is available in Australia, Dan Active, which is a drink which also has sugars to it, which may or not be a factor. Mirror Reason is there. It's close. Um, generally, I know the Mirror Reason and none of the above are um, contain the same content. So I would be inclined to go for Mirror Reason and Paracassi as a first go round, perhaps. If the budget allows it, try the pendulum. Again, as I said, it's relatively expensive for probiotics. There's only one manufacturer of it. It can, does contain acromancia. Um, and then we have it down low. And here we have things to avoid. Um, for example, Saccharomyces boulardii, uh, which is often taken for a variety of conditions is not something which is um, recommended because basically it pushes every, every all the research has that it pushes everything on the list either it has no impact or pushes in the wrong direction hence the pure negative impact now we also have mixed impact which is may help may hurt and here we have the relative fact basically i compute the, the helps the hurts take one away and the net result is there so you can take a look at a bunch of there there's a chance it could hurt but in all assuming everything is equal then it probably will help more and then we have a bunch of things which we have no no impact on we have absolutely no literature whether they will help or hurt so it's up to you if you take them or not or if you're taking them for another reason keep doing it Okay, so that is going through and goes on and on and on. In fact, I will quickly close that and close that. And then on the bottom, we end up with favonoids, which are um, favonoids, which are in many foods. And we have them listing um, herbs, spices, etc. Generally, the favorite noise are being studied, and what we have here is we have the food which the favorite noise is in ranked in terms of the combination. So you see that. You will also see, um, for example, resorbitol is here, and it's identified as a mast cell stabilizer, which could be good, same as with quercetin. And if you take a look up above, in our suggestion you will see guess what resorbitol so we have it showing up in two different computational tracks same result which is always a good thing you have increased confidence magnesium is another thing that comes up here so we actually end up doing two different analyses with two different scopes and come up with suggestions some of the items will overlap back and forth so we go down and we'll see there are apples, walnuts, uh, anisette, bananas, fennels, etc. So those are foods you perhaps should try to include more often into your diet. Okay, so after all of this long blah, 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 what we have done is we have looked at the canned suggestions from Jason as to what he deemed a healthy microbiome. We use his standards and we just go with, with it. Okay, now let's go back to the samples again because wait, there's more. 
and we go to the same sample down below and we go here and we'll take a look at the next one down which is called the Kaltoff mole trap and the Kaltoff mole trap is something which um, a fellow data scientist used for financial data which seems to work nice in terms of the microbiome it established high and low values for a particular microbiome where the values look like it's going strange so therefore if we have from the data itself not from clinical data clinical study but from the data itself we have determined a high and a low threshold and anything outside that threshold are things which we simply want to say uh that's try getting those things back with the pack with the normal thing is a reasonable estimate and then usually the, the problem has been trying to figure out what the range should be what is our range is jason did it from his clinical experience dealing with patients um the count of multrop does this from pure numerics um analysis of the data microbiome from two thousand samples and we just go and click that one and voila it is another easy one again if you click bacteria details you'll see what it's focused on and what we have is we may have some overlap and some different ones um so we have in this case believes everyone we have had a bacteroids um actually let's go back and take a look at it because it's well worth the, a quick on-screen comparison um that's the right one and Let's look at the samples here. And what I'm going to attempt to do is put them side by side. And uh, that's there, okay. And ah, uh, grumble, grumble, grumble. Okay, we'll do it this way and put them side by side. And give me a few seconds and I'll get it sorted. So what we have is two sets of bacteria, which is different. Here is interesting to note, it says it's too high here. Over here, it's too high, but we are looking at, at a specific component of this larger bacteria here. Other things like acromancia is not on here at all, um, which I'm not surprised at. Acromancia being too low actually this debate whether or not that you can ever be too low uh, basically acumensis shows up with western diets and non-western diets you don't have it uh, it depends on how much grain you have the more grain you have in your diet the more fiber you have in your diet the lower the acumensia levels go doesn't mean it's unhealthy it just means that it's a reflection of the diet so acumensia being too low is something which is debatable um just recently heard a talk from somebody of uh, california on that specific issue and acromensia she deems to be a relatively poor predictor um we have other things and often these things are um some cases they are combined and some cases they're not um lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are both deemed important here over here they're not let's go down into this, to the suggestions and see what the differences are okay and we have two very different looks between the two that we do find some commonality like this bacterial subsidence is on both lists we do find a couple of strong voids which weren't on the other list at all and so we end up with a there we have a question resorbitol being an avoid in combination and sometime and that's because that's how the study was done and i don't see resorbitol sitting on this side so we end up with different things we have mainly over here some very strong avoids which would be probably something to pay attention to and then over here it's there now that ends up leading to the okay we got two different sets of suggestions what do we do oh what well, you it gets worse um but what i have done is if you go back to the 16s report you will find is once you've done two samples it will get consensus suggestions it will actually do every 
set of suggestions you have done, it will combine them, giving them equal weight to each one. And we'll go and give a consensus with the safest one being on top. These are ones where there's no contradiction everywhere. And somewhere it is a in positive count. And as you can see, it is pretty often there. You can sort the columns by one thing. Burdock roof, which was on there. A couple of these. Ah, oh, a bunch of them are already on the list, which I agreed with Jason. So you can just go on, safest take, and then safer take, which are ones which there are pros and cons. As you can see, it, it, it has a net take of 4.84, net avoid 0.85. So it's probably something good. This one, next one, is net avoid of 0.03. Good goodness to it, the 6.51. Probably definitely do it. But because it has some negative risk to it, it is called a safer. And then likely safe, we have nothing. Okay. And then we have our avoid list, which goes on and on. And there's lots of antibiotics there, which are things to avoid and we do have details about about many many antibiotics specific to which bacteria they impact and now we have higher risk and avoid so we have certain probiotics to avoid tannic acid resistant starch and you can see the relative value so you can make a judgment call uh like this 1.25 and 7.93 pretty clear you should avoid the next one 5.7, 10.58, uh, depends if it's dealing with other things. And some risks are generally avoid, which means that the um, numbers here are pretty significant. And there's a last one which doesn't show up there because there is none of them which are the absolute avoid, as in every way we try getting suggestions, we get different things. At this point in the time, you probably want to say, wait, stop. How in the world, what's the right answer? In fact, that is typically what people ask. What is the right answer? There is no right answer. Anybody who suggests that it is a, this is the way it should be done, is blowing smoke at you. Um, it just doesn't, there is no right answer because there's no clinical studies comparing different approaches to one another and seeing which one actually works better. It's all personal belief and speculation. What I try to do on the site is giving you a variety of different models which you can make use of. And if you decide to try all the models, you can do a consensus report. So you sort of have what is what we have as a consensus between all the different models on all the different things. And you will end up with often a Good size list, 17 here, of uh, what you should be taking, which has no known risk from any of the models. In other words, these are definitely the census. So the consensus report is something which I'm hoping will resolve the uh, model A says don't do this, Jason says do that, so and so or this support says this, which will go on endlessly and you get lost in confusion. Just do each approach or do the ones you, you have some, some credence in and look at the consensus model. So let's go back to the samples. So that's consensus model. And what we, I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of thing. I'm going to first do a clear consensus model. So it's gone. There's no longer any consensus there because I haven't done anything. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over and do some other samples. I'm going to go over to sample visualization, my biome view. And this is very informative for people who are new to the microbiome. You see on the left, you have a hierarchy. Basically, it means that things in this species belong to this genus, that belongs to this family, that belongs to this order, class, well, Think of it this way. This could be a continent. This could be a country and a continent. This could be a state, like the United States or a province in, in the um, 
country, this could be a parish or a um, county in the state or province. This could be a city within the state, within the within the county, within the province, within the city, within the sorry. Uh, okay, and the next level down would be the city, in the county, in the whatever, or it could be a neighborhood. But it's this type of hierarchy which we see around us in terms of the general population. So there's a hierarchy, and what we want to do is, well, is there a state which is very much doing badly, or as in too much unemployment, or too little um, income, or some other things, and, oh, it's not safe. How about is it a county level? Is it a parish level? Is it whatever? So we want to take a look at the levels here. And what we have here is we have a bar showing where your value is roughly. And then we have a percentile. That a percentile means that 20% of the samples have less than what you have and 80%, 100 minus 20, have more than what you have. So it says, okay, you are in the lowest range, but you're not, in general, you are not particularly abnormal. There, you're just in the lower range. Uh, just like a person is maybe middle class in terms of income. They may not be at the top of the middle class range. They may be near the bottom middle class. Doesn't mean that they need food stamp or other um, support. They're just within the range, which is defined to be expected so we go down and as we go down we see more and then voila what we do see is we see a couple of things which are marked here as being high 99 percent down be high here and generally the account of markup picks all the ones which are very high here as you can see here but there's nothing stops you from adding in Something else, like here we have something which is 92%, here's something else which is 94%, there and there. Remember, this level that Jason operated on is at the genus level. Here we are saying these are the specific species. Different species react to different foods slightly differently. So going down to the actual species, we'll get a finer tuning of what's going on. Here we have something else which Okay, so there, and uh, we'll do all those sort of species. Generally, it's best to try keeping everything on the same level, if practical. And we go down, and then we have things here which are too low. And uh, there, and we can hit here. And we'll have only one thing underneath there, so we do it. Notice that if we don't have a bacteria reported, we can't select it. And the reason is simple. There's so many bacteria people don't have. And there's no reason you should have it. It's sort of like saying, okay, oh, wait a minute. Should our population have somebody who is one half Negro, one quarter East Indian, and one quarter Caucasian? Right? You start going down, you start, if, and the, the Caucasian person must be descended from the Mayflower, and the East Indian must be a relative of Gandhi from India, and the Negro must come from Nigeria. You can end up overqualifying it and say, okay, we have to have such an in there. We don't. This is a melting pot, and the bacteria comes and goes just like ethnic content of a person comes and goes and is a mixture. So don't be too concerned there. What we want to do is take a look, and in some cases, uh, you may want to go and pick something because you just don't like the looks of numbers, which is not surprising. Here we have Doria. It's down, and you can say, okay, um, this is your value. This is the range. It's a bit below, and you say, no, I, uh, I'm not going to worry about that. And you can go on down here. Here is the low and the high for the um, count of multi-drop ranges. So you can see how far away from the bottom you are and how low the bottom is. And you can now make a decision to do it like this one. We would say, ah, forget it. 
you are halfway to the bottom level and it's not that drastic. And here we have something which electrical source actually comes in as zero. And I'm going to say, I want that um, there. Ah, that's an interesting. Um, okay, the 50 percentile here shows up if there's a problem doing a match. Um, that's an interesting thing to show up. Um, so I'm going to skip that for the moment. It's something I want to take out. So you end up having a bunch of text marks. And what you can now do is come to the top and just click. And it will come back here. And it will now show a new automatic one, which is hand-picked bacteria. And the hand-picked bacteria shows you what you pick. So you can hand-pick the bacteria which you think are most important. I've got a visual inspection or from your own research or whatever. So you can go back and pick it. And once you have it picked, you come back. And the hand-picked bacteria, you can um, go over to suggestions. And that gives you the actually the full feature suggestion ones. It's not counting, and you have to you have to make decisions here. You go and figure out what you want to do, as in what type of stuff you want to include or not include. Uh, you probably may want to exclude prescription drugs or non-drugs or sort of this over-the-counter stuff, which could include in it um, acetaminophen or um, Benadryl or other things, so whether or not you want to include that is a subjective choice. And um, you've got other choices. If you are, um, are a privileged member with professional access, you get just showing up, and it mainly gives information which if you are really wanting to know why suggestions are happening it will point you exactly to the why so show suggestions to the new window and here we have the suggestion hey, wait a minute i recognize in you and before for being walnut these these some of these are the same ones which we saw on jason's but none of the bacteria which we picked are the same ones that jason focused on but the environment to make a happy gut which may have different bacteria seems to be lacking the same type of thing as before and we have there so we have gone done that again we can go down and look at commercial probiotic um, and then we can see a variety of items there mere recent shows up again which is interesting and then over here we have ones which are to be avoided. Some of them can be major avoids. Uh, Cure bios is a particular type of culture found in some kefir, and it has a negative impact, which could imply for some people that if you're doing kefir and doesn't and your health problems continue, actually the kefir could be contributing to the health problem, not helping it, despite common internet mythology about it. Okay. So we have there, we have our suggestions there, and we go back and we can go back and we can do a different selection if we want. And what happens is that the moment we get two set of suggestions, and I'm going to go back to Jason's there and come back because the moment we get two, uh, okay. Is a bug that sometimes it takes free before it shows up. But okay, um, actually, I'm going to do once more. Oh, okay, and now let's go back. Ah, okay, now it's the second time it showed up. I have to figure out why that's doing it. Um, okay, so we have um, the consensus there. Um, if you actually want to move your data to a different facility or source to do analysis, you actually have the ability to download the data after being transferred here in a variety of common formats, 
so you can go and make use of it or since it's a csv file you can actually open it up in excel so that's there but now what i'm going to do is i'm going to show another way which is we are going to go in and look at probable symptoms and we have a whole variety of choices that the ones that makes the best prediction are by bacteria and by Kegmaltra. I've done a separate blog post where I went and did something like 13 different people and see how, what agreement we had between the forecast symptoms and the ones they actually reported on. And these two were the ones that did the best. The consensus, which means takes everything, well, did not do as well as bacteria or cake marker by themselves. Okay, so we click that. And we have a variety of there. And so we have things here, negative values are there. So the negative values here is mainly to ease for sorting. You can go in and you can see all of them. And there's just 20 entries there. So you don't get a horrendous amount. Um, that's so we have this particular case, this person, you see the magic word reported because he, in his entry, when he uploaded his sample, he went and marked the symptoms. So we have a whole bunch of symptoms that, hey, we're doing a pretty good job. The microbiome did a pretty good hit on the symptoms he have. There's 485 different symptoms. We're looking at neutrality, and we seem to have a pretty good number there. How many symptoms we put in? We can actually go back. Ah, uh, he did 115, so he has about 25 percent of the symptoms are listed, um, which is a good number. Um, people with different symptoms have different priorities, and so what we go to do is we are going to take a look look at some of them um the ones which are reported because those are the best and let's go in and let's take a look at hhvcs the human hepatitis virus and there and what we're going to do is we're going to just click on here and voila we have the actual details which bacteria have we by citizen science ai identified as being the probable bacteria which this person has. Um, there's 58 listed here, but if you go back, uh, actually, let's go back elsewhere, um, you will find the total count for how many are possible. So what we have there is we have there, and if you notice, we have a bunch of things automatically checked, the same way as for hand picking. And what we have here is something which, is not in most medical studies. In fact, I was talking to a PhD candidate this weekend. He got it exactly and agrees with me um, that generally people work on bell curves and most clinical studies look for people at the top of the bell curve or the bottom of the bell curve. But if you have a large enough sample and you get a group of people who are not at the ends but in the middle, but the group is large enough and the population is large enough, you can tell if they are statistically significant. And if they're statistically significant, you know you have a different distinctive population. And that's what the middle peak is. It is things which are not in the extremes. It's that instead of the average person, the, the typical value, the medium value, the 50th percentile being 500, the medium percentile for just group of people is 750, but the extremes are up at 900. But because it is there, we can actually make use of that in terms of things. So in terms of trying to figure out. And what we are doing is you will notice we have genesis as species, genus class. So we could go and exclude something if we want, like say, okay, now we don't want to in classes, we want it to be finer, so we just do family etc and we have how many matches do we have we have 48 very strong which is a good number so what we're going to do is we're going to click here takes us back to the same custom things we can now go and click the suggestions and we can go and take a look here 
Interesting. Um, Nicorish is on a void disc. It was on the void disc of the earlier ones. Um, Reservatol is on the list. So, although we're looking at it from different way, the mixture of bacteria which we're trying to change seems to be receptive to the same particular items. So it's there and vitamin B12, etc. So those are things which we expect to help. Um, sometimes you will get contradictions between them, and that is because of the nature of the studies. Often they are on a specific population or a specific population with certain conditions. And with that combination or that diet which they are from or that ethnic group they are from, you get a ship going one way, but with a different culture it goes a different way. And there's no way to really sort it apart from putting in lots of qualifiers which we don't have for many studies. So there, and we can take a look at the bacteria in detail. We see this horrendously long list, but you can go on custom pick. And if you go back to consensus report, we now see we have one more added. And if you do view consensus, we now see things which are safest and we have what well, we have now but by clicking and sorting we find pomegranate is really number one we have juicelum artichoke which is inulin usually but because the study referenced to it as juicelum artichoke and not inulin I entered into our database as as Jerusalem artichoke. So I've kept faithful to what the study used, even though I know many cases they are almost the same, but almost I don't like ignoring. They, they can be site differences because Jerusalem artichokes have other chemicals involved with it. When you do an internal extract, those other chemicals are lost, and some of those other chemicals may be a factor in the degree of the impact. Um, there, there we have a bunch of cinnamons sitting there. Um, then we have burdock root, which we have two, four, or one against. We're seeing the dark cacao again. Um, more stuff like you say, highest risk or avoid. All these are all negatives. Um, which are things to basically about high resistance starch, celluloids products. Uh, vegetables, um, which is entry sodium chloride, um, and then we have high risk, practically nothing, and then we have two probiotics, which has some risk, but not that bad. So we end up doing consensus. So let's go back and do a recap for everything which we have done so far. Okay, so far. We have with one sample gone in and used two can methods. So if this person has chronic fatigue syndrome, then there's an already prepared item there. We have advanced suggestions, which um, we'll skip for the moment. We have the ability to go in, in and look at probable symptoms for bacteria. And if, if some of the highest value symptoms match, we can go in and do it, so we can go back here. If you have multiple symptoms which are of concern, what you could do is go in and select the second one. It will come back. Again, we have this 19 bacteria involved, 16 are strong. And we can just click here, goes through, creates another sample. Here's the suggestions. We can go back here. And if you go down here, we see we now have four samples being rolled up into consensus. Which ones, which one of the, the methods of generating or which feature is, is the best? We don't know. Frank, honest, we don't know. The consensus basically is trying to find the absolute safest of all the suggestions and the most dangerous of all the suggestions simply on probability. So you're trying to stack the cards in your favor by going with the consensus report. 
Okay, now let's take a look at some other things to it. Um, sample visualization, let's go there. We do have the one that's called pie charts. So you can go in and take a look at things by whatever level you want. Pretty pictures. Um, just type thing, most of the commercial labs shows you it, but it doesn't give you anything concrete in terms of what it is, it shows you pretty pictures and then somehow you're supposed to magically know what to do with it. Here I try doing the magic for you and give the explanation. So we can have genus and find out which ones are the dominant ones, etc. So it's a bit of fun. We have the same type of data also available in a different presentation, which is uh, something called the Corona chart, which basically puts everything in a collapsing, expanding tree. So you can go in here and you can now go and when before we went down to a genus level, we did genus through everything. Here you have the ability to say, okay, here is a, I think this is a, uh, family I double click that tab and now I see the breakdown for everything which are in that family and the percentage so it gives you a different presentation my opinion a better presentation but it takes a little while to get accustomed to working with all the stuff so you can go down even further if you want like for example if I click here and what we find is we have a bunch of the minor ones we have the other which means these are bacteria which have not been identified by science led they exist we see the signatures for them they haven't been given names they haven't been classified so that's there so you can see how many of the stuff or the unknown for me the unknowns are interesting because when i have had uh, relapses of some medical condition the unknown has increased significantly which would imply that the bacteria involved is not known to modern science, but it does work. do a number on me. And then as I go into re remission, this nasty bit of other fades and becomes normal. So it is an interesting aspect of the microbiome that we don't know what's in there. We can see what's in there because the methods being used, we can identify the bacteria which belong to the general group, but we don't have enough information to know where in the, that group it is. In other words, these are unclassified people or whatever, uh, somebody who doesn't fit nicely into all white, um, black, um, Latino, um, or Asian combination. This is a different group of people which could be Native Indians or something else, which we have not labeled in terms of our analysis. Okay, so here, and then for this one, we have to do a go back to get back to the page. So we have gone through all the charts, except for one, bacteria interaction. And bacteria interaction comes from a recent bit of work. And what it does is you can zoom in and out. And you see, we have this little thing here, which is acerobacteria. And you can see by the width of the thing, how much everything feeds it. And over here, we have something else, which is very much. So this little bacteria, which we don't have that much of, has a major impact on that bacteria. So we now see that. But the, what really does it is these two feeds it not as much, not as strong impact but because there's a whole lot more of those it causes that to increase so we can go through and and play around and see what it costs so we have here we have all sorts of stuff going in there so if you have something which is of particular interest to you like roseburdia which is 90 percent you can just go here and you can see what influences what feeds that particular bacteria and how much of that bacteria it is. Some things have a big impact, but we have a small amount. Other things has a small impact, but we have a large amount. All of this comes from the citizen science uploads 
and it's sort of fun to explore and see the relationship. Uh, I don't think anybody else has done as, has done as much depth of analysis as you saw in here. And everything is definitely statistically significant, um, which actually blew me away when I got the statistical significance showing up as strong as it was. So it's there. Uh, and so it basically there, red decreases. Most of the time, the association is fees, not decreases. Very few of them seem to actually be inhibitors, which is sort of interesting. And then we have colors to represent what degree of rank it is and you see there's a whole stack of different uh things from rosberia here is a genus here is a species so this species species ah of course it's a species in there another species in there which is so the total count here is significant and that is being fed by two of its children again these are species feeding into the genus, so exactly what we would expect. But over here we have another strain coming, uh, or another subspecies from the, or family, um, coming from elsewhere, which actually has a little bit of influence on it. So this is children, part of the clan is causing it and feeding it, but over here, which we have something outside the clan, some external bacteria is feeding it so that's is the last one of the um, visual representations so we've gone through the representations we have symptoms all of them are there we do have a second way of looking at public conditions and with that one, we use the National Library of Medicine data, which are from clinical studies. Personally, I have problems with them because the results are all over the place and the results are, they border on very significant, but enough to, to get a publication on credit for some researcher's name. So we click here and we have percentage match. And the best percentage match is for gout. Hay fever is number two. Basically, there's 14 bacteria which the studies have shown is connected to gout. You have 50% of them. Here you have 19, 47 are matches. Okay, so yeah. Word of warning. Often the lab tests itself won't measure some of the bacteria reported in the clinical studies, which means, uh, you get a bit of fun there taking a look at it. but what you may want to do is take a look at it and see if, if any of them rings the bell if they do you can click through here and lo and behold you see the bacteria the values and little explosion windows and match so i could go back here wait a minute i've seen this baby before and this baby before and this baby before Anticipate. Remember, we had a bunch of matches. So what we're doing is we are marking out the matches which deals with hay fever. Just that. And now we're going to go and add them to handpicked bacteria, which is here. So if we do a view there, we see everything which we have selected. And this is a cumulative list so if you want to take a cumulative you can just keep building up the bacteria if they're duplicates it goes into the list only once if they are not duplicates it gets added to the list and now you can go and go back to the samples and get suggestions we'll do that once more so i go into handpick bacteria you may want to clear it if you want to do it independently or you may want to just accumulate everything which is relative to you and do it that way. Again, go to handpick suggestions. Just go through and so, oops, one second, I'm going to go back because I want to click that one because I want, I've got to show you what I did last time around. Okay, which is here. So here we have inulin, 
You remember Jerusalem artichokes was also on their list. So they are both almost the same thing. But the studies recorded different things. It's a hit on this for what is or isn't reported because of the what labs they're using, what the labs detect. There are so many Cisco factors, it's a nightmare. But what I want to do is go over here. And just as game for the, at a professional level, most of you probably don't really care. But if you are a natural path or MD and you want to understand how in the world I come up with these suggestions, just click here. And what you have here is you have over here what it does, the context. And then you have where the publication comes from. And you can go in and uh, take a look at the article right here. If you want to just click. And there it is. You notice, in this case, it comes from rats. The data is not 100% for human studies, unfortunately. And the reason it's not is there are not enough human studies. Vet studies have far more information about what might what modifies the microbiome than, than for humans. My assumption, which you can question of course, is that when it comes to bacteria, if something feeds a particular bacteria, doesn't matter what species it's in, it's probably safe to assume, pending better studies, that it will affect a bacteria in other species in a similar manner. Not necessarily identical, but in a similar manner. So we go back here and we have there, and as you see, there are 74 citations here. So you can go here. So we got a hundred citations and the hundred citations ended up with that suggestion. Why? Because it impacts so many different bacteria here we can go and there we can see there are a ton impacting one particular one increases so this consensus there other one it increases increases so we see that it increases every time a study says same result it increases the probability the value we give to using it it's basically hey there's absolute consensus that this thing helps that. So information is there, and that's the basis of it. Most people are not interested in reading 74 studies just to find out why I pick England there, but it does explain how I get that as a suggestion based on the number of studies and the number of bacteria impact, and the bacteria impact are up here. And the ones here are the ones in the citations and in and what impacts it has on it. So it's there. It's data sources are public and are actually easy to access with, without having to do it. They're already pre-filtered and it's sitting there if you're a professional. Makes life a lot more confident. The other thing I should point out is we have this little magic button here. This magic wand goes over and give you the dosages. One thing I have observed with many people is they have no idea of the dosages. In fact, I'll make it even worse. Most MDs have no idea of what the dosage is. The most common family practice MD probably are going to grab a number out of the hat or say, oh, what does it say on a bottle? That's nice. What I've done is gone through studies on PubMed clinical studies or um, trials and gone to and seeing what the dosage is. And if it's a study like here, this is the dosage to use. It was effective in chain, making a change. In other words, that it was sufficient here that whatever was being studied had a change. And that's a criteria I use. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as the change. Often people will go for such low dosages, well below that use in chemical studies, nothing works, and they say, oh, it doesn't work for me. That's why I've been slowly adding in dosages for each thing as time comes along, and something is critical, 
or to you, email me and I'll see about adding it in. And let's go back to there. Uh, for example, I see Inulin is, doesn't have dosages. I'll probably be today or tomorrow going to add that in because of, of it coming in. Soy, same thing. Grog beans, again. Wherever or not I can find dosages, various things like grog beans. Uh, I suspect clinical studies are not going to show you how many cups of broad beans a day the average person has, but it's there. It doesn't show up on the avoid list. Why? It doesn't make sense to get those stuff to avoid. So that's a little bit more. And so let's go back and continue onwards to uh, one and two things. So now we have changed in your microbiome, there's a couple of other things. We have a backdoor way of doing things. And there is a resource called the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Gene and Genomics, which has done DNA analysis of species and strains of bacteria. Most of the lab reports give species and strains. So we take the species in the lab report, we take the strains in the uh, in the cake or Kyoto Encyclopedia Gene Genomics cake for short, we combine them, and from that we find out a variety of things. We find out how much of uh, certain types of products are being produced, how which markers are being produced, how what enzymes are being produced. So we get all of that information. We can go in and take something like a look at the enzymes, which in some cases some people may want to, and we have there and we have 38 there and what we have oh this is just the ones out of the range if you go back that's i picked the wrong one i was going to go and overwhelm you uh that's outliers uh component analysis is where i was going uh okay enzymes which shows everything not just the ones which are out of the range And it goes and gives a few moments. It's a big page. Da da, it's there. And you notice there's 1,300 different enzymes being produced by the bacteria in your gut. You may only have 400 bacteria types identified, but they produce 1,300 different types of enzymes. Think of it, this one, you have 400 factories, they produce 1,300 different types of goods or pollution as the case may be and all of them have lovely lovely technical names now what you can do is go up here type in something like histamine ah and we have nothing there we could go in and um ba -ba 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 -ba. oh Uh, if you know the technical name of what you're looking for, you can just type it in and do it. More importantly, if you go over and you click here on it, it will actually take you over to the CAG website and you get all the technical data you really don't want to have to deal with. Uh, but it's there for people who are gung ho in getting really into that. What I do is for each one of them, I go through and I compare your values against all of the other people's who have uploaded 2,000 other people, and we'll go and compare them. And let's take go back and let's go back to the cake enzyme outliers. And as you see, we only have 38 items here, much smaller list. But if I go over here and take a look here and I click on distribution, you will see a the chart of the values which everybody has. And what we have is what's called a log curve. And the reason is um, if you do a look in percentage you get a rather odd looking things like that 
But the question is, where does it become abnormal? When you do a log value, you notice that it's basically straight from here to here, and then it starts curving. And here you have on it the value you have, and it is close to where things take off to the bizarre similar. If you had the value down here, then it would flag it as an extreme value. So it's most people will sit somewhere on this line, nice and flat line, easy to visually see. It's when you get in the top or the bottom, it will flag it as doesn't quite feel right. No chemical study saying it's the wrong value, but in terms of mathematics, in terms of statistics, in terms of visual representation, it just doesn't feel right. So that's there, and that is there. Let's take a look one at the low ones. And here is where you are, and this is where the flat line which most of the population sits on. And you can see the cutoff point is up here, and you even further down beyond the cutoff point. So you have an issue here. Again, you, you may not be that familiar with it, you can go and take the name, do a search on it, you may find a Wikipedia article which explains things better. Don't ask me to explain this 1,300 items just for the enzymes alone, all technical. See a professional, which may not be UMD, you may, MD may be looking at you like a deer in the headlights um, there. But let's go back to the sample. What I have done is I have used that and then I have gone and looked at what enzymes are being produced for probiotics. So if you are low on a particular enzyme, guess what? If a probiotic produces those enzymes, it is logical to assume that that is what you, what may help you. And that is exactly what I've done. And so we have pig AI suggested probiotics basically doing a lot of number crunching and coming up with things which would appear conceptually to make your enzyme mixture you have in your gut and being produced by your gut more balanced. So let's go here, take a look, and here we have it, and here we have the items being done. So we have uh, Lactococcus lactis is there as an item, Jephcarcus romanus, all these are commercially available probiotics, and then the relative rate, like Bisolanus. Some of those things will not have actually been studied in clinical study. You never get them from, from the other ways because there's no data with them. But going through the genes and the genetics and seeing what produces and what doesn't produce, we actually get a totally radically novel way of getting additional suggestions. So that's what happened here. Um, Colossum Britannicum, I find often occurs. And here we have, to make your life easy, who provides it? And what we often find with certain type of person is the Sunway Pharma, the Biosum Instant has three of the bacteria which are often suggested. And that's about the only thing that is in that particular probiotic, which is interesting because it seems to be a very good match. Okay, again, those won't show up in the consensus report. Those are something you have to manually remember to look at and include. And similarly, because we have cake products here, as in end products, chemicals being produced, we have suggested supplements which uses the same logic. In this case, we find the supplements are NADH. Uh, this person, I believe, has chronic fatigue syndrome. I know there are a bunch of studies finding that NADH helps chronic fatigue syndrome. I don't think there was any, I have come, encountered any study showing how NADH modifies the microbiome. It just happens to be there. It, it's this nasty habitual disconnect where you have conditions, something helps it, but we don't know if what helps it impacts the microbiome, and but we know what the microbiome is as the condition. So we have two disjoint bits of information using the genes and genomics. We actually seem to be able to get the two coming together 
or connected by the back door. Another one is Mobidium, which again, I also recall seeing studies finding that it actually helps with chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so it's sort of, hey, okay, you could suggestions agreed with, with clinical studies, but we don't have any literature on the impact of these substances on the microbiome. So we are backdooring it um, there. Okay, and let's go on. Okay, uh, we have outliers, end products outliers, which is obsolete. It doesn't produce as good results for predicting symptoms, but for some of you, it may be um, these are end products and these are things that seem to be outliers. Um, you, the range expected is 750 to freaking 80, 730. So the person is actually, has probably less hydrogen sulfide than typical person, but that's probably good. Hydrogen sulfide often is associated with health issues, so having too little is, hey, no, com no complaints there. Uh, almost everything here is so low CO2 producers are low. Uh, uh, et cetera. So it gives things, some of these things are a little bit of uh, fun. You can click here and you can go and see which bacteria do we know produces. And guess what? Your count is zero for bifidobacterium and your count is low for lactobacillus. And you can see what the average count is which is why you're so low in that particular end product. So it helps you to explore and to, to explain, and you also, if you want to, find out where the data is coming from. And there we go. Here we have all the studies saying that this is being produced by this particular bacteria. Um, so if you do find something which I've missed, please fill it in, put it in there, give me the link, put a comment there, and I will periodically go through all the suggestions. And if it needs something I've missed, I'll add it in. There's a lot of stuff there, but I figure I'm going for 90, 95% completeness. So if somebody can raise to 98%, I'm happy, and everybody else prosper from it. Okay, now, Let's go back to the bottom again. So we have changing your microbiome. We have the outliers, which are the all these. Again, they tend to be technical, not in the brain fog end product, which is um, somewhat useful, but you can at least see why you don't have enough of something coming through by identifying the bacteria. Medical conditions outlier basically says, nope. There's nothing there where your values was way in the extreme compared to everybody else's value, which is probably good. If this person has chronic fatigue syndrome, exactly as expected, because chronic fatigue syndrome usually has everything coming back normal, which means no alternative diagnosis, which is exactly what this prediction page is suggesting. Um, Okay, uh, that simply gives you the outliers, which we saw already elsewhere. Advanced suggestions is again, very similar to everything else. Um, there, we can go in there. And you can select, the, for example, I use the count of mold drop ranges as my default. You could say, okay, no, I just, I want values where my values are in the top three or the bottom three percent of all samples, or the top and bottom six percent, or the top and bottom nine percent, or twelve percent. So you can define what too high, too low is by percentage, percentile, and thereby you can go and select the criteria to select the bacteria. Um, let's do three percentile there, and what we're going to do is we're going to do, do there. And what we're going to do is we're going to go in and use PubMed studies on chronic fatigue syndrome. And we're just going to see where we go with that. And there we have. So we have up at the top, 
These are the bacteria which are associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, one is too high, which is known as not a healthy predictor from somewhere. I hopefully, ah, yeah, there it is. There is a citation for why we need to not be a healthy predictor. So you can go and take a look at that. Here are things which are too low, and other things which is too high. So you have all of the bacteria which were selected by the conditions constraints you did. You have your combinations here, and typical for right for a chronic fatigue person, vitamin B12 is suggested, which is well documented in the literature to help um, chronic fatigue syndrome. And then some never B vitamins, which is again pretty common. NAC never common. Melatonin supplements helps. Uh, caffeine, cough, cough, cough. But here we have one particular bifidobacterium, which is strongly recommended. And we don't see anything else on that list for probiotics, uh, which indicates that this particular probiotic of all the ones is probably the ones that are most likely to do it. Again, dosage you should be doing. Uh, at least uh, that's a thousand million CFUs, that's a billion CFUs per day uh, is a dosage. Again, specific, very specific one. And then usually the fun is finding it. Usually I suggest just customprobiotics.com to see if it's there. In fact, let's do that right now. And we have Bifidos lactus here. And Animus lactus. They are the same name. The animus is, is, is dropped often in the product listings and the lactose is there. Now you may have a sicker shock price with $150 or what uh, probiotics. Yes, it's $150 for a bottle of probiotics. But here's where the catch is. It's not capsules. It is actual powder with no additives. And basically what we have, we have the scoop size. How much was the minimum dosage suggested? Minimum dosage was 1 billion CFUs, 400 billion. So you have more than enough even for a child scoop of 0.01. So, and they provide you with a child scoop. So 0.01 grams there. And how much do we have there? And we have 50 grams, 0.01 of a gram. So that means there's 500 dosages for here which means you have two years of supply at well above the recommended dosage, or you can go even higher. I have one year for 155. And if you look at any other probiotics, you got one year supply, you're talking well above that amount um, for almost every probiotic. And the nice thing is, it is one thing only. No inulin, nothing else. It's pure, simple what you do. I do not get a commission from custom probiotics. I use them. It's just that they are sweet. Now, let's go back and do one last little thing because I think some people may want to be aware of it. We have retail search probiotics here. And... What we have here is we have the back, the custom probiotics, which is this one. It actually ha has the species on, they don't list on their side, but corresponding with them, I've got the exact species being used. And exact species is generally preserved, preferred, because if you have exact species, it, it's going to be constantly tested for to make sure it is still there because it's a proprietary. Somebody owns that particular species and there's a strong incentive to make sure that it doesn't mutate. You click here and you find that in this case we just have one single study um, and you can go in and read the publication on the details. Um, and Describe here at TNF alpha, ILC, interferon factor 6 and 10, 
and so it goes and tells you what the impact is so it's there and you again what i strive for is open data sources absolutely open so you can always know where the data is coming from if you disagree take a look at the, at the study and don't argue with me i'm a librarian i'm not an author look at the studies okay Ah, oh, I think it's getting close to to bedtime or upload time, as the case may be. So we expert consensus health analysis are um, somewhat mimicking what many of the testing labs do, um, and what we do is we have consensus and we have. From variety of sources, how many recommendations are there, and how many do you have? We have 29 things. How many are deemed to be high? How many do the value deem to be low? And lo and behold, you may find some cases outright disagreement. You some people say you're too high, some people say you're too low. Uh, here is an example. Two people says you're too low, and one person says you're too high with the values you have. These are experts and they don't have consensus. This is just giving you the information so you can see. And there's no recommendation for levels for 29 bacteria. And not everybody has recommendations. Um, for example, if you go down and here we have pre recommendation. One says too high, too low. Zero says too high, which means two of the recommendations say you are in the right range so not a joyous thing again i hate to keep saying this but nobody has to knows the right answer if you accept you're ignorant and you do the best you can you make progress if you demand the right answer you the microbiome ain't going to be friendly to you and let's go over and Health analysis is again similar to what many commercial sites attempt to do at health status. Um, comes from eight particular studies here from, from the Nature Journal. You have one healthy species, you have 10 unhealthy species. Okay. And um, then down below. We try to estimate 50 expiled symptoms health, condition health is 50 expected. So in terms of estimators, general condition health, you okay. Um, two things you are way off and you can go and see the distribution if everything works. Uh, looks like I have broken page. Okay, I'll go back and fix that. Uh, Hopper recommendation gives his gives his l low and high value and what your values are, and says the magic word ideal, not ideal. Just showing the breakdown. This is his magic combination of bacteria, and then the unhealth bacteria, which comes from up here, are, are listed down below, and. Whatever the issue is, for example, here we have in our health of bacteria. In another case, we have it's deemed by many people to be a site, be a pathogen. And in other cases, it's associated with blood pressure issues, fat content, etc. So it gives you some background as why certain bacteria may be of a specific concern. Okay, back to. The many, many, many choices. Okay, um, we have done component analysis there. Um, and symptoms, hand-picked bacteria, consensus suggestion, visualization, end products and cake, um, which is, I think, going to disappear. I think I've, it's an old thing, which I haven't removed from it. Update percentiles. Is something which you occasionally may want to do. The numbers are recomputed usually once a day, since no more than once a week. 
So, so all it does is make sure all your numbers are absolutely current to whatever the current standards are. So it just is a nice uplift, and I see. Uh, okay, basically. The real uncommon ones you don't view. This person is pretty good, which are lab specific, which are relatively, you have no relatively rare bacteria in there. Most of the bacteria you have are, are commonly seen in most people, which is good. Uh, the uncommon ones often can be interesting and area of concern. But let's not go there. Let, um, Okay, so I think we have covered everything here. A bunch of the items up at the top will actually take you to more reports, like, um, let's say, keg monitor symptoms. We'll give you a list of everything, but you could now go and look for, let's say, we look at the word fatigue. Um, that's the chemical sensitivity. We see there are five relationships. Pretty samples have that being reported. Uh, but that's not have high Z score, the bigger or the smaller the number, the more predictive it is. So we have hand to eye coordination issue. We have a very strong Z score, which means it's highly unlikely to just be a random effect. We have eight samples, eight people reported who have this problem. We have 17 relationships we have identified from those eight samples, which is interesting. And we click here. And what we find is we have eight items, two are strong, one is strong, three out of the eight. That actually is pretty weak there. It's more coincidental than anything. And here we have what chemicals could be involved with it. And um the shift thing is it's high we have 77.8 is the percentile so you're high but not particularly extremely high and level one is a middle peak 78 so again the peak we see for this particular item is not extreme it's just shifting up and you have have a high shift up interpretation is now nah, probably it's not something to bet on okay um uploads you have probably already have done explorers is what we have come through so it makes predictions from the predictions if you click on something you can go and see what your um what the items are but again remember if you go in and go underneath symptoms it will Instead of listing everything, it will just list the most probable symptoms. For example, cake maldras here. And we have the um, most probable symptoms, which is an infection, parasite, other, which HV6 was a flagged item and was reported. Uh, age 30 to 40 was reported. The microbiome does change by age, and there are distinctive shifts with age, and the fact that, hey, uh, the microbiome reads like 30 to 40 year old, and that person reports himself as being a 30 to 40 year old, I find a bit amusing, as in, it's not what you expect, but it does do it, and other things there swing there. Um, if we sort of weight, uh hyperthyroidism is a possibility you perhaps should be checked whether or not constipation and diarrhea not exposure is another thing heart or cold spell it's often people aren't particularly aware of that because they just get so loose to it they don't think twice about it um etc so um a lot of the predictions are things that the best term i can think of is being hinted at doesn't it's not predictive and it's not caught saying will happen it's just there are some similarities in this direction and if you can you may want want to get yourself checked to make sure you don't have it maybe a developing um, condition or something to worry about rheumatoid arthritis it's not uncommon for cfs patients to develop 
Uh, you see, it's also uncommon. I know one to see it was patients who who ended up going to work to see or um, uh, Crohn's disease, which is a progression from it. Um, so we have a bunch of things there, and that's it. So uh okay look up gives you the ability to look up what modifies what bacteria something important ah i know the one thing i didn't cover which i think is worth covering sorry there's so many bells and whistles here is see impact of probiotics actually um it can be for antibiotics too or anything we have a modifier we have about four or five thousand different modifiers so if i go in and says okay Let's put in minocycline. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Didn't find anything because I had a spelling mistake. The percentage signs. Oh, there we have. We have down here. Sorry. Oh, so now we have it there. So I clicked that. I have to go, go up here and click update. And. It shows it and it says, okay, just as quick estimate as the benefit. Hey, look at that, all positive values. And guess what? Minocycline generally helps people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Imagine that. Um, let's go in and go into something like um, penicillin or, or um, let's try sulfur. Uh, oh, actually, let's try something a little bit. Triptala. Uh, okay, which. Click that. And there we have Triptala, which is an Indian herb. So I'm going to click there, but I'm going to uncheck this one so I'm going to see what the net result is of the two of them, of, of just Triptala by itself. It's also a neg positive impact, which is good. But how about some of the other way? Let's try just one, which which is there, and I'll click two of them. Let's see what its impact is. Oops. Uh, no, I don't want to take that one. Please, please, I don't want to take that drug. In which case, I'll go back to the MD. hope you have a good relation with him. Say, okay, give me some alternative drugs which I could do, which, which serves the purpose you're trying to do just as well. And then you put them in, and you find out which one has the, the best positive impact on your microbiome. Simple as that. Sweet little thing. Um, again, these are crude estimates, but done four different ways. So you end up um, having a, um, if everything positive across the board, it should feel very good. If everything's negative across the board, uh, you probably don't want to take this prescription drug or just assignment somebody suggesting for you. And it just makes it easier. Okay, now, um, now we can, we have more bells and whistles up here, but uh, I think at this point of time, I'm 90 minutes into this walkthrough. And we have a ton of things up here, uh, from suicide and food, um, references, and I'll cover those in a different, um, YouTube session because there's just too much on the website. I mean, the website is, excuse the saying, it can be exhausting because you get so much information available. The consensus report is your, should be your lifesaver. It means you don't have to go and figure out by hand between five different ways of approaching it. Which way is the right way? Again, we don't know. And some of the, the wings are totally independent of each other and come together. For some conditions, they chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm aware of the literature. And when I see something pop up with some of these way, ways, ways like the um, cake, keg suggested probiotics or um, supplements i sort of go chuckle because guess what they are actually a match for the literature which is sweet but that information is not in, in, incorporated in there i do have a 
side project which I would love to get going, but I need a lot of long tears because there's a lot of data entry that has to be done, a massive amount of data entry, and I just don't have the time to go off on that tangent. Okay, so that's going to be it. I'm going to sign off for the moment and explore and stay tuned for a number one, which I'll walk through the top choices on the menu. And we also have compare samples, which is probably going to be a third long sessions. So this is the introduction. This is probably, hopefully not totally overwhelming. Remember, there are some simple choices here. These two and then consensus would be a good start. Going over, enter your symptoms, which you can do here. And then once you enter your symptoms, take a look at the probable symptoms where you have a match with, a, with the highest Z value or the highest weight here. Go and take a look at the bacteria involved and see add that in as a third hand-picked bacteria choices or actually this is goes in a, in an alternative spot for it um and explore so that's basically it um i'm gonna shut up and get this processing for upload